I want to especially thank all of the BSR members who participated in this year's annual State of Sustainability Survey. I apologize for the number of emails I sent, but, uh, but really appreciate all of the input that we got. We had 150 companies actually respond, which gives us incredible insight into the state of sustainability in, in all of your companies. This year was the eighth annual, <clears throat> excuse me, eighth annual survey with our fabulous partner, GlobeScam. And we want to share some of the highlights of our findings, paired with the additional GlobeScan insights and research on global sustainability trends. Chris Coulter, the CEO of GlobeScan, is a real expert on reputation, brand, and sustainability. And I'd like to thank him for uh, his great partnership over the past eight years on this survey. So Chris, please come join me, and we'll share some trends with all of you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everybody. Um, heart and head. I think I represent a different part of the body in this episode. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, good morning. Bonjour. Comment ça va? <clears throat> good to see you. The last day of BSR. Um, I am going to frame up the why we need to be bold, and then Laura will take it home and talk through how, examples of how we can be bold from the, the research that we did collectively, from a lot of your perspectives and opinions in the room on what bold looks like and what bold should look like. Now, the why piece. This is a, you know, I can hear my 10-year-old daughter whine, why? Why do I have to be bold, Daddy? Why, why this? Why can't it just be normal? Why can't we be normal companies and kind of do the usual thing? And our challenge here, of course, is multifaceted. And yesterday we had lots of examples of the, the rational reasons for why we have to change, the systemic challenges, the scientific evidence that's there. So that's all, all clear. And there's this messy social part of the equation we also have to attend to. We've got to respond to where people are at and mobilize folks going forward. Otherwise, we can't actually execute on the boldness that's required. We can't change things too radically because people, we need to bring the world and people along with us. So why, why do we have to be bold? Well, we know, as Lord Brown said yesterday, social capital is a critical ingredient in this crazy VUCA world, you know, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Our English colleagues in our London office call it a VUCA world, which sounds much more appropriate and, and uh, <laughs> provocative. But it, but it is this world that we all live in and understand and experience every day. And at an increasing pace and challenge for us to respond and even understand the dynamics behind them. So we've got this challenge. And in this sort of volatile, uncertain uh, context, what we need, of course, is something as amorphous and elusive but valuable as trust. And, and trust is a grounding of how we are able to ex execute our boldness and bring people along. There's all different kinds of facets of trust, and trust is a complex subject and a very slippery one in many ways. Everyone wants to be trusted, and why wouldn't you want to be trusted? If we break it down at least into two different areas um, to make sure we're a little clear on the kind of trust that's required to be successful in a VUCA world, on one hand, we have thin trust, which is really transactional. It's how do we sort of engage on a very narrow sort of confine. Let's think of Starbucks, for example. If you go to Starbucks and you want a latte, um, or a latte macchiato now, which is sort of what I prefer. You ask for one of those, you get it, and you expect to get it at a certain price, at a certain quality, at a certain experience and time. And that's the transactional thin trust that all of most of brand equity has been built on historically. Very narrow, very important, a fundamental part of how we maintain our relationship with consumers and deliver products and services. But, it, but it's a part of the conversation, and it's very difficult for us to get into a bigger conversation around social capital without something we call thick trust. And thick trust r requires us to get beyond the transactional, to think in broader terms, and to build relationships on multiple fronts over time. Very difficult to construct, takes a long time to do it, but that's the level of robustness that we need to weather this challenging VUCA environment that we're living in. We know as we need to execute boldness going forward, a lot of change is required, and we have to do it at a scale and pace that we have never done before as a species. So having that social capital in our bank accounts is a, a fundamental piece of, of why, <clears throat> why it's important. And if we see trust levels across some of the tracking we've been doing since 2001 in a thick trust context of operating in the best interest of society, we see net trust ratings for global companies at zero, well behind other important institutions that inform and engage the public on public policy issues like 
academic and scientific institutions like NGOs. And we have these poor orphans on the end of national governments and global companies in a real uh, predicament around public trust across the world. And this is a challenging circumstance for us to try and shift the game. How do we create new systems of mobility, of food, of technology, of governance with this little bit of trust? We've got to be very proactive and aware of reaching out, engaging people in different ways and new approaches to try and rebuild that piece. And the challenge if we don't do it is that there's um, someone else is going to do it for us. And of, and of course, there's a great um, back and forth between regulatory pressures and our ability to convince people that we actually are responsible and engaged as corporate citizens. And here's a, a wonderful question we've asked over the years um, that relates to the expectation people may have to regulate companies to be better, to be more responsible in different ways. And the trend line is pretty provocative. We see this little swoop at the end and 63% of people across the world now support government regulations for companies to be responsible, perhaps to even be bold and be different. And that's the challenge that we have. If we cannot get, a, get ahead of the curve here, we will be regulated into some sort of capacity that's not terribly um, efficient or exciting for a lot of us in the room. That's why, let's talk about, um, <clears throat> first before that, let's talk about uh, the, the kind of summative element of how do we get to thick trust. One, uh, one piece of uh, work we've been doing quite a bit lately across different sectors is trying to understand the constellation of thick trust and how do we build it. One piece of that, of course, is competency. It's how you do, what do you deliver, in what degree do you differentiate in how you deliver functional elements for, for public and for society overall. A second piece is how you do it. What's the human approachability, uh, openness, transparency, thoughtfulness, that you are able to engage. And both of those are important and balanced, the functional pieces and the emotional pieces in many ways. And the third aspect through all of our research across a range of different sectors is this purposeful piece. Without that understanding and that North Star and the narrative as to why you're acting in certain ways and the way you're doing it, it falls a bit flat. None of this is new. The newness is that we need to do all three of these things in balance on an ongoing basis to all different stakeholder audiences that we engage with. That's the challenge. We can do one sometimes very well, lots of detail and competency. Sometimes we can be very emotive, children running through fields with sunflowers, for example. And sometimes we can have purpose that's sort of superficial because it's not buttressed by some of the competencies and human emotive factors. So that's the kind of constellation of issues we need to think of as we try and rebuild social capital. Okay. So I think that's a great landscape for the why and why are we all here, why, are we, why do we do what we do. But the harder part sometimes is the how. How do we actually get things done and how can we all be bolder? So the eighth annual survey that I described earlier was a, we actually asked you all this question and we asked you what does bold leadership look like? How do we know when leadership is just leadership? How do we know when it's really driving bold action? And there were five key areas um, that you all responded with. So the first was around being truly ambitious. And I think there's been a lot of conversation already this week around what does that kind of ambition look like and how can you be ambitious and aspirational even if you don't know how you're going to get there. The second was around being collaborative, and this room is certainly a great example of that, but all of the different collaborative efforts that you do with individual partners, that you, how you collaborate inside your organizations, as well as how you collaborate across sectors and across industries. The next was about being really integrated and that you can't really truly be bold if it's individual one-off siloed efforts or if it's individual programs, but that integrated approach so that it truly is a part of what your business does, that's how you're going to drive bolder leadership. The next one was about looking for transformation and being truly transformative. And I, I think one of the challenges of our field over the past two decades has been that it's been a little too incremental. And so every year we improve, um, but at this point we, we see the why. We see this huge case for why we have to have bolder action, and that's going to require more transformative change. And then the last one was about transparency. And so again, I think as part of our contributions, as well as the ability to start to rebuild that um, important trust factor that Chris talked about, we need, to, we need a much higher level of bold transparency. So being bold um, is, is certainly important, and you uh, agreed with that in the survey. 
So 70% of you said that the um, COP21 agreement reached in Paris is important to your business. And you were not sure of that the year before. The year before, there was a little bit of anticipation, but we didn't know if it was going to be truly important to your business. I think that's now clearly said. More than half of you are already integrating or planning to integrate the SDGs into your corporate performance targets. So we've got these great global visions and these great ambitious uh, targets to reach. Now it's about integrating them inside of our companies, and, and this is a great step for that. And also, about half of you said that sustainability is among the top five priority on your CEO's corporate agenda. This was a really exciting finding for us and was a big jump over previous years. I think it was about 30% just a year ago. If it's one of those top five priorities for your CEO's agenda, that's going to enable you to, to achieve that kind of bold leadership and all of those key elements I talked about. All right, so that's where we want to go. What, what about where we are now and whether or not our current performance is actually meeting these bold aspirations? And this is where the, the news isn't quite as good, um, but I think we're, we're set on the right path in the right direction. So first, uh, most of you have an overall approach to managing risks within your supply chain, but you're maybe not really going beyond that tier one. So we seem to have stalled out a little bit where less than half of you are actually addressing risks beyond tier one. And only about a third of you are even setting goals for your suppliers. So you know a lot of your impact is deep in the supply chain, and you're not actually engaging your suppliers and helping you to achieve your goals. Same on human rights. Most of you have a, a formal human rights policy. You have an approach to human rights. But then when it comes to actually getting things done, less than half of you have completed a human rights impact assessment. About 38% have specific KPIs that you're actually measuring around human rights. So there's a lot of room to really help bring these up. Um, and then same on climate. So great climate policies. Hopefully a number of you are beginning to really align your work with some of the agreements from, that comes out of the, the Paris Agreement. But less than half are procuring renewable power. Only about 38% are already setting science-based targets. So we need to see much greater progress and a, great, a more rapid pace of change to be able to achieve the bold, uh, the bold aspirations we all have. So, so what's preventing this kind of bold action? So one, what we saw is that the integration has not yet happened. So we've seen that great improvement. We've seen it being one of the top five priorities for your companies. But it's not integrated into strategic planning yet. It's not integrated with your finance functions and your human resources functions. And that's a great way to start to, to really make this real within your companies. Again, internal engagement. So that we saw pretty moderate to low levels of engagement across different functions. Um, and then external engagement. Many of you, and, and we heard yesterday from Lord Brown about the importance of external engagement. And yet many of you are still engaging with stakeholders the same way you did 20 years ago. So it's, it's ad hoc, it's one-to-one -one relationships, it's maybe only with big global NGOs. You haven't modernized the approach to engagement and that doesn't enable you to actually get all of that input from the outside world and really drive greater uh, progress. So thank you so much again for, for participating and we hope this gave you a great sense of, of why you should be bold and, and some ideas on how to be bold. Thank you.